Cool. Where are you now? Birmingham, Alabama. I'm going to be honest. I don't even know where that is. It's in a state somewhere. <laughs> it's in the south. And um, my state of Alabama, it's sort of near Atlanta or Nashville. Do these sort of ring a bell? <laughs> they ring a bell, but I don't know where the bell's ringing from. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's cool. Are you, are you on tour right now? Because uh, you do a lot of chamber music stuff, right? Yes. Um, I am, you know, always moving around, not in, in a tour at the moment. Actually, it's kind of... Um, I have about a week and I'll go perform uh, in Nashville and then I do maybe one city a week or something like that. So I always go back and forth. Very I like chill. to. I like it. Yeah, Very I don't chill. like 20 in a row or something. I don't Makes even like crazy. one in a row. That's too much. <laughs> 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 oh, no, I gotta do this. Do you ever listen to other type of music besides classical? I do. I listen to a variety of things, but it's a, it's a bit of a strange thing because I have very um, small list of songs I listen to on my iPhone. Uh, I only have about 30 songs that I listen to over and over again. <laughs> like when I, when I pack, I listen to a specific song and, you know, I... Um, arriving in a new city, I listen to a specific song, and it's it's um it's a lot of repetition. It's like each song presents an activity. Uh, I like Eric Clapton. I'm a big Eric Clapton fan, uh, and I listen to the oldies like Sinatra and Velvet Underground, and uh, oh. it's a little bit of this and that. <laughs> oh, classy. I just I I listen to the radio whatever's on then I turn it off after a while and I get sick of it then I go my own head. <laughs> uh, if I drove around in a car I guess I'd listen to radio all the time but where are you living now and where were you from so I was born in Korea and I moved to Long Island New York about an hour and a half east of New York City when I was uh, 11 years old mm -hmm. and then um, when, I, when I turned to 18 moved into Midtown New York and oh, wow. I lived there for 12 years and so I guess you know people say after eight years you become kind of a true New Yorker so I really got used to, you know, the pace of New York City, only to find myself, you know, falling in love in Birmingham, Alabama, when I was performing uh, with the symphony as um, playing Rachmaninoff concerto. And and then I met my my husband. He, he's a double bass player. And we met after the first rehearsal. And that was that. <laughs> oh, there you go. What was that in New York? I've never been there. What is it like? Is it a very just bustling city, very intense, everything's go, go, go? That's just my impression of it. I might be totally wrong. It definitely is. You have to be of a certain, I think, personality to feel like you belong in New York City because it's it's such a high pace um, place and everyone is in an extreme hurry to to make it in whatever field they're, they're in. And... And, you know, just day-to-day day day living costs are so high that you have to be, you know, pretty successful to have, um, you know, no one has a comfortable living in New York City. <laughs> you know, you're always uh, searching for ways to, to survive in a better, you know, condition. And so it, it is it is dog eat dog. That's the expression. You know, it's uh, you can't you have to stay awake so you don't get scammed. And you have to move fast. I think you have to stay in contact with New York City. You know, that's uh, the cost of living there is so high. But each night there is an incredible event happening one after another. So you have to keep up with the city, stay active, stay awake. <laughs> and there's like inspiration all around. So I think New Yorkers really feed off that energy and uh, 
that's you know inspiration all around so it's it's a fabulous place wow. it's just for people that love to you know do a million things in a row every day <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a city i have to go to uh, well you know australia because i lived in sydney for a couple of years sydney seems like the new york of australia i don't know have you ever been here Yes, I. You know, I thought Sydney. I mean, I fell in love with Sydney when I first went, and Sydney to me is like maybe a little bit more West Coast because it's like so much more nature oriented and oh. things are so much brighter. I felt like Melbourne was maybe East Coast in my opinion, but that's uh, that's very good. Uh, everyone talks about Sydney being one of those expensive cities no one can afford, so I get the feeling. New York's that place, you know, it's like, ah, oh, paying rent off, doing these things. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, I think um, it's it's a luxury to have, you know, a nice place, one bedroom, two bedroom by yourself. It's, uh, you got to be pretty successful to not have like 10 roommates. <laughs> How crazy is that? <laughs> it's so true. Um, <laughs> oh, crazy successful to live by yourself. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I think because like studios go, you know, very easily two to three thousand dollars a month Ooh. for a tiny little hole, you know, if it's in a nice part of town. And we're, when we're talking so, US dollars, just remember the yes. exchange rate. Australian dollars have been pretty crap for the last few years. <laughs> so you but um i must say like when i moved to alabama which things are much cheaper here but um i never realized that cocktails could be dollars. it's like in new york you you have a drink and it's you know at least 18 dollars a drink you know <laughs> yeah it's so, so true pretty crazy so ridiculous <laughs> oh I don't know. anyway we're musicians we we drink. Do you guys have a thing called goon? I think maybe it's no. In Australia. What's that? This is very cheap wine. I don't recommend it, and I don't think you should touch it. But it's about you know ten dollars for a liter of very just tastes like piss almost. But I uh, I tried it once. I never tried it again. But if you want to experience this culture, you can try that. I want to ask you, as a pianist, it's a very curious question. How much does the chair you use affect your playing, or does it at all? The chair. I've never uh, really uh, made custom order to the bench. I usually just uh, use the the standard Steinway bench that looks like a challah bread. You know, mm -hmm. it has that uh, the cushion. When I was little, um, I had a back to my bench because um, my aunt, who was my first piano teacher, didn't want me to slouch. And just having this 90 degree behind me really did help um, coming up to the mid uh, part of my back. But um, it's more the, the way you sit rather than the bench for me. Uh, always leaning a little bit forward so you're not, uh, uh, you're feeling most of your weight on your hands, not on your, um, on your behind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> on your behind. <laughs> Well, there you go. Is this something that you have never been asked that you wanted to be asked in an interview? Uh, <laughs> this is an interviewception right now. Well, I did kind of felt like going around asking different musicians like how exactly they memorize because I think it's very different depending on who you're talking to. Um, so how do you memorize? I, I'm a very visual person. And, you know, when I talked about you with Augustine, he always says, like, everything you describe about music, it's through vision. And I, I don't see anything. So very often, you know, he's just guessing as to what I'm seeing um, and hearing. And I have some mode of... Um, synesthesia where you know certain tonal centers like d major and e flat major 
um, I branch out of there. It's definitely color oriented. And then I, you know, think of the texture and then the landscape and um, I figure out the bigger, bigger picture first. And then I get smaller and smaller and fill in the, the blanks as I, you know, learn the piece and try to memorize. But uh, I am, you know, I learned by ear first two years of my education. So I'm a terrible sight reader. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just by listening, I I think I do much better. So I have no, um, I don't restrict myself from like listening to all these different recordings. Some people like feel like their inspiration will be shot if they listen to someone's rendition in, a, in the fear that they'll start, you know, uh, imitating that recording and I don't, I don't feel that fear at all. I think we all just sound like ourselves, no matter how much we try to be someone else. Mm. Um, at the end of the day, I think, you know, you, you're whatever you are and what you're feeling, what you believe in, it'll just spill out on stage. So yeah, I listen to a lot, which helps me memorize and, and then, you know, I, I draw a little maps um, with my colored pencils and shapes. Uh, with my black and white pencils, and I try to map out the the music in my own little way that helps me memorize much quicker than just like staring at the music and playing through it over and over. Can you give an example of that? The coloring of the map on your scores or music? Yeah, I um, actually have a little um, YouTube clip that I made because it was very hard to describe what I actually do and for this piece by uh, Bartok called Out of Doors, there is a fourth movement called The Night Music. Uh, and uh, it's centered around, you know, F, F sharp, you know, there it's all very ambiguous and terribly difficult to memorize. So I, um, I really drew it out with my colored pencils. And there's a little clip where I go through each note and tell you what I, end up memorizing which is very different from the actual music it's uh it looks like the artworks of kandinsky Mm -hmm. in motion it's like sticks and colors dots and uh little amoebic squiggly lines objects are moving as i'm playing the piano so it's uh some people said it looks like a map of an uh, amusement park like Disneyland. You know, it looks like some kind of crazy little map. But uh, it's like a blueprint that I draw for myself with um, each piece that's, you know, hard to memorize. So, what's Kandinsky? I'm also as illiterate as I am in the arts as I know the States in America. So Kandinsky um, is an artist. Arnold Schoenberg was... Uh, friends or in relation uh, with Kandinsky and they, their art and music sort of were interlinked and uh, his uh, when I look at Kandinsky's artwork it's it's very much uh, musical it's like seeing music in front of you even though it's a painting that's not moving there's so much movement and so much color it's, uh, it really makes you think about what uh, what this uh, piece of artwork could translate to it, and it's uh, yeah, I really like it. There you go, guys. Check out Kandinsky. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you have perfect pitch? I do. Okay. I don't have it like four forty, four forty one, like uh, to that extent. I'm a pianist after all, but. I I think I discovered that I had this thing called perfect pitch at age six or seven when my parents, who are both scientists, brought me to this teacher to, uh, you know, test me on whether I have perfect pitch. And it turned out that I could turn around and figure out which note it is and, and then two notes and then three notes. And I think that's the point where my mom, was convinced that I could actually hear something and maybe, you know, she should get me to good teachers to start serious music lessons because my first teacher was her sister, her younger sister. 
uh, who is a fabulous, you know, teacher of very, very young children. Um, but yeah, I, I remember thinking, you know, it's, it's a very obvious thing um, to know. And to, when I found out that not everyone can hear that, you know, that's color yellow and color yellow sounds are all, all D's. You know, I was saying stuff like that. I remember thinking all the, you know, all the songs that were yellow in my mind share the same key. So I think that's how I went about remembering uh, pitches because I would hear something and then I would put it in context. And I was like, well, that equals, that sound equals yellow, which apparently people call it D, ma D, you know, D major or the note D. So I think there were all these like color correlations that had something to do with it. But um, yeah, the teacher was like, turn around and she put her hand on you know, note D. And then she said, now you can turn around and tell me which note I just played. And I went back and, and played that same note. And my mom, I just remember the amazement in my mom's eyes, like, How'd you know that? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you don't know that? Well, I mean, it's obvious. So that's when, you know, they they were amazed by my little ability to hear. So you're hearing colors. It's interesting. Yeah. I've always wondered. I've got relative pitch. But it's trained, obviously. But I'm wondering, is, can perfect pitch be trained? Um, obvious, like it sounds like you kind of fell into it and you recognize it through patterns of colors. If you had to teach someone perfect pitch, how would you go about it? I think you would play a song or a piece they know really well in the, in its original key and then show them what it would sound like if it's maybe a third above or a third below in another key. And I think the, the feeling changes quite a bit. Um, if you know the piece very well, the mood of it will shift and they'll recognize what kind of changes it brings to, uh, to the core of the piece. Like if it modulates, let's say the original key was. Okay, so listening to a different key, for example, from E flat major to G major, you're feeling different emotions because the colors change. And you're trying to recognize the color. I'm just recapping because it got a bit choppy. But <laughs> um, <laughs> but listening to it so people can start recognizing or feel the like an emotional differences, even if it's just the third part. You know, I'd say for me, it's kind of like I, I tried, actually. I didn't try that hard to get perfect pitch, but I tried. <laughs> um, I remember when I was a little kid, I played this violin piece called Banjo and Fiddle, about when I was 12, 13. And you learnt it in the key, I think it was A major. And then I had to play with this piano, which is tuned down like 430 or something ridiculous. And I remember I couldn't play it. I don't have perfect pitch, but I couldn't play it. And I, my left hand started shifting up to the actual key. So it sounded correct to ah. me. Um, I didn't know why, but my hands would not follow what it's learned. It just kind of slipped up um, towards that key and making it happen. Ah. Um, but ever since, but kind of throughout the you know, last few years, it's, that kind of disappeared. I kind of forced my hands to stay to adapt. So, but it's interesting. I don't, maybe I had some sort of pitch sense and I just said, nah, you don't need pitch. You just <laughs> need to play. <laughs> That's cool. Um, if you had to meet a composer, um, not just dead or alive, but, uh, you know, what's, what's the word? I've lost the words. What's it? Commission a piece for them. Who would it be? I would love to have an original Robert Schumann written for me. That would be, I think, something I would cherish for the rest of my life. I mean, I, I'm sort of obsessed with Robert Schumann's composition. 
uh, it's been a number of years now that's, you know, I can't get enough of it. And I try to include it in every recital that I play just because it frees me from, uh, I guess, the burden of performing alone, maybe because of his multi-personality syndrome. Mm -hmm. I do feel like it's somehow a little bit more like chamber music, even if it's just me. And uh, I'm just uh, fascinated how, he, you know, the, the kind of uh, thought process he has and the kind of freedom he sort of implements into the music. And uh, if we got to know each other, what kind of piece he would write for me. Fantastic dream to have, I guess, sort of become Clara Schumann for a day. <laughs> How would your husband feel about that? I want to be Clara Schumann. <laughs> <What the? laughs> He'd be cool with it. Oh, He's a bass awesome. player. What a cool guy. <laughs> I have respect for him now. <laughs> um, <laughs> you come from, your parents are Korean. Oh, I actually went to Korea a couple of years ago in Seoul and Daegu. Uh, first time there. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I don't know. I just loved all the food. What there's a thing in the markets called hot dog. Is that, is that what it's yeah. called? Yeah. I loved it. I, I went back to the markets just to get that. We only had a few days in Daegu. But um Nice. Mm. But how would your parents let's say if they meet someone, how would they introduce you to people? Just a stranger? Yeah. Or their friend, or even their friends. Just how did I? <laughs> Everyone's different. Like my mum always, she she kind of talks me up way too much, and I that's just I just have to leave the room because it's just too much, and I'm it's just way too exaggerated. <laughs> it's like, oh my god! I'm like oh no no. I, I... <laughs> well, my parents are very different. Mm. My dad would talk about me nonstop. You know, he's probably. Uh, he is my biggest fan mm -hmm. and he will you know, pay you to continue talking about me, you know, and he's, uh, I'm an only child and my dad and I look very similar and we have similar temperaments. So I am sort of like his mini me, he feels. So he'll go on and on about all the nice things and how talented. And um, so I, I'm, I guess I'm kind of used to it when we, go to dinner parties, you know, when it's his turn to talk, you know, he will start talking about me shamelessly, which is very sweet. And then there's my mom, you know, she's more, uh, she's very sharp, very task oriented, very humble, very strong person, but she's, she's not gonna even try to describe me. She would just be like, you would just have to meet her. But uh... this is my daughter, and she is, uh, you know, she might not even say a pianist. She might be like, oh, and then that's it. <laughs> she might and be what? So she's, she's she, she'll say, like, oh, she's in this, uh, in music. But, uh, you know, she's not going to give away all the details. And, so, you know. vague. <laughs> so vague. So <laughs> vague. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The first one you meet, uh, you'll get a very different version. Yeah, it's like how broad can he go? It's like, oh, so what do you do? Oh, being a human. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> then, and what what is your reaction like when your dad, you know, kind of talks you up, talks, to, kind of shamelessly explains to everyone what you do? Do you kind of smile and nod, or do you walk away, or just kind of after all those years of training? Well, I, I don't mind it. It's not uh, definitely not a negative feeling. I don't feel embarrassed. Uh, I grew up uh, with them talking about me all the time. And I was, you know, always the kid at the dinner party, you know, where they're all adults and then there's me. Mm -hmm. And I was constantly, you know, probably playing some thing for you on the end of the night and, and I was always that that kid had that had 
a lot of adults' attention. And I thought that was pretty normal. You know, as a kid, I was there to entertain the old people. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I felt comfortable around them and uh, I liked being around them. And I knew there was going to be a point where my dad's like, oh, Joyce, this and that. And, you know, my Korean name is Hiwan. Yeah. It means joy source. So that's how I became Joyce. So it's like, he want me this and that. And I'm like, oh, okay, there he goes again. And I just sit with a smile on my face. And I was pretty chill, I guess. That's, that's just play your pass. Oh, my turn now. <laughs> I just like, be nice, you know, be like, oh, thank you. You know, be humble. You know, that's a Korean style. You never just like agree to it. You're like, oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you deny everything. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's funny. Oh, well, there you go. Actually, now that you mentioned, I I also enjoyed the adult's company. I'm just sitting there, but mainly because there's always free food. You know, you had a big dining table and there's just food coming in. And you just say, like, yes, <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready. Uh, <laughs> and when you're young, you, you know, like your friends, they don't give you free food. So unless they're friends' parents, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, for sure I'll come. Um. <laughs> Let's let's talk a little bit um, back to yeah. classical music. How long have you been playing piano for now? I started to play when I was four, and I just turned thirty-one, so twenty-seven years. Oh, okay. So twenty-seven years. In the last twenty-seven years, have you noticed a significant change at all in classical music, or has the style been the same? You know, just. From observation doing concerts and stuff and everything i think the role of the musician has changed a little bit i think we are so dependent on the internet and the social media now that classical musicians that really do well has a side of them that is very comfortable with uh facing the public and I think people that are more inclined to share about their non-musical selves, like day-to-day -day stuff or walk around with a video camera, capture what they think is interesting, you know, do, do better with, with the public because it's just uh, that the genius closeted case um, that's can't do anything but play their instruments and be genius at it, um, d doesn't translate as well at this time. I think people sort of uh, the person within, and I don't know if it's the popular culture that spills over to classical music or it's just, uh, uh, just something that happens. But uh, I think musicians these days spend a lot more time doing all kinds of non-music related self-promotion stuff mm -hmm. do you think the non-related self-promotion gets in a way of what they want to really do or is it something that works in your favor it's a very open-ended question because it could be different scenarios yeah. yeah i think really depending on the personality it could be a great outlet for you to uh, be free from your art form and sort of be silly and uh, and it comes easy to you but there are people that I just absolutely can't do it and and then instead of not doing it now I think the musicians hire people so they can do it so they can face the public better uh, so I think for some people, it's probably much harder and it, it sucks a kind of energy that is uh, very draining to them. But um, I, I guess most musicians, you know, we are, of course, you know, here to define all the beautiful and all the, uh, the magic behind this art form, but also you know, without the audience, without facing the people, you know, our, what we have to say ends with us. It is dealing with 
people out there and you gotta you you know that you have to leave the practice room and get out there and express yourself one way or another so it's it's just uh, uh being brave in a slightly different way but it, it is in that same uh stepping out to express yourself so i think that that's a bit similar so leaving the practice room that's easy for me <laughs> <laughs> going in the practice room. I mean, leaving the story. practice room to go on stage. Uh, oh, okay, <laughs> they, that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll move into my practice room then. Um, okay, then this leads to, do you think, um, again, another quite open question, where do you think classical music is going? Um, like, in terms of, do you... Uh, do you just yeah what is it going to open up to more people is it going to kind of niche down to a small group of people um is it going to change is it going to be less or more of it um will it ever be mainstream you know classical music kind of hard to say but i think it will always have a very special place in the music uh, world and industry there will always be people that uh, love only classical music and nothing else. You know, we have that that true market where uh, this beats any other kind of music. And I I think it's it takes more effort to another form of music because it is so complex and it's just the kind of thing when you hear it 4,000 times, suddenly you start to understand. That does happen with a lot of the repertoire and people have no attention, a very small attention span these days that, you know, they can't handle it the third time around if the first two times they didn't really get it. They're not gonna give it the third chance. Mm. And so it's that, that really detracts from um, a lot of people that, uh, just don't have the patience for it and uh but but i do think it'll always exist because musicians that are classical musicians most of us i think can't see ourselves doing anything else and this is our pride and joy and every day session and our love and so there will be always group of musicians always going at it, <laughs> no matter what the world is, but there will be a group of classical musicians still practicing like eight hours a day, uh, trying to get it right. And, and we will have that, uh, always have that truly passionate following, uh, whether it's going to become mainstream. Uh, I don't know. I, uh, I think that will be difficult just because of the the uh, the high pace, uh, short attention span thing that I talked about. Mm -hmm. But it's never gonna, you know, uh, fizz out by any means. I mm -hmm. think it'll uh, always be this like special little section where, you know, the aficionados gather and and rejoice at like the next great rendition of Goldberg Variations. There will always be <laughs> so, so it's like a fine wine, I think. That's how I see classical what music. What do you think? Yeah, I think classical music, like, it's interesting you mentioned. Yeah. It's, you know, and you usually, for... you know, people that, that support classical music, love fine wine. They kind of seem to go hand in hand. Mm. Um, yeah, that for sure. Uh, what do I think? Uh, I think about it, but I never really came to an answer, to be honest, <laughs> about classical music in the future. Um, I think it really depends on what the current musicians do. Um, there'll always forever be this, you know, like you said, that special thing about it, um, that there'll always be a group of people that love it. But, um, and also, yeah, like a lot of responsibility on musicians' hand to keep, keep it alive. 
Um, and I mean, mainstream, I don't know as well. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know if I want it, would like it to be full on mainstream. Um, cause then classical music might become the pop music. Uh, this is this ideas so if it's played 24 7 everywhere you know what is the next classical music there's some sort of feeling about classical music being like it's really special for only you know a group of people that really dedicated themselves to learning the music um it's almost like you have to work for it <laughs> rather than just yes. come at you you know it's one of those things where it makes classical music special so i don't know i mean but i do believe there will be Will always be that group of class musicians and it just fluctuates up and down you know we go through really great times tough times um but i reckon people will kind of fix it you know if it's really tough people jump in and help keep it going if it's going great people will love it at the same time but that's just my i my thinking so far my thoughts so far thinking good english um so if you had to i guess Let's say piano pieces. If you have to put a album album together or recording, what pieces would you put in for someone that's never listened to classical music? I think I will try to gather most of the pieces that have high impact on the first hearing. That <laughs> speaks truth. Yeah. I think initially I have to gather pieces, uh, short pieces that uh, I remember hearing for the first time and brought tears to my eyes. Oh. Uh, rather than something super uh, dense and complicated that they would only understand after listening to it for many years. Uh, uh, maybe the second movement of Ravel Piano Concerto, maybe maybe a short excerpt from Stravinsky, Rite of Spring. I mean, just snippets. I think it, it just, it's sort of this uh, kind of sound that hooks you, that wants you to come back for more. I think it needs to be introduced in a way that's, uh, that creates some kind of awe around this powerful music. Like, uh, I think one of my favorite uh, famous pieces that came to my life and wowed me was Beto uh, Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. Mm -hmm. That's the first symphony that sort of got me, got all the tear tears rolling down my cheeks when I was 15. <laughs> <laughs> And what so much, but each each piece sort of bringing out a completely different emotion and different era, and just showing them how colorful classical music can be, and what a variety there are. It's not just one one. I don't know. I think people think of something very uh, very popular, but they know like three classical pieces and they think that's what it sounds like mm -hmm. and to just sort of open up um their mind so they say oh it's so different depending on what what depending on i just cut off again the last part depending on depending on what composer or time period you are exploring. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, wow. well, there you go. Um, I think that's it. I mean, just to respect your time. I think they are the questions that okay. I think we wanted to ask. Uh, is there anything else you want to say that you feel is important? Just put it out there. You know, going back to whether classical music would ever become mainstream. I think it's like, to me, that instantly almost sounds like two opposite things because of what also what you said in a way that people that love classical music kind of love it because it comes with work. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like working for your traits, right? It's really easy to understand. What what you say? It's like working for your traits, so you work for it. It just the the treat tastes better. Um, you can appreciate more somehow rather than just being given it to you all the time. That's how I see it. But yeah, so you're saying? Yeah, it's um, it's like trying to understand the highest, most complex form of physics. Like you're not gonna get it by going to two classes, <laughs> but people that get into it, you know, after you know, doing their research for 20 years and they like start to like understand something that that joy is kind of like the joy you'd feel when, I don't know, maybe the Beethoven's Hammerklavier uh, seems to be something you can understand. I mean, that's a revelation when that happens. Um, and it's for people that want to put in the time and the effort to understand it, not like sit there and um and say like i don't get it mm -hmm. like it, it takes a special attitude to like want to learn it and to understand it so much for it to actually happen and not many people are like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was, oh wow it's reach so classical music is almost like reaching enlightenment you know <laughs> feeling whoa being and then becoming chill okay. becoming chill <laughs> Yeah, very often when I say I'm a classical musician, they're like, oh, I love classical music. It relaxes me so much, puts me to, to right to sleep. So it's like, oh. <laughs> and I really wonder what they're thinking of. They're probably thinking of those, you know, like spa facility music. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not even classical. It's like, <laughs> it's like little, you know, um, bells ringing in the distance. Or maybe they're just already tired and they're going to sleep anyway. <laughs> So just put classical music on for the sake of yes. it. <laughs> yes. Oh, well. But... It's not the music. <laughs> it's not the music. <laughs> I, I think you can fall, if you're tired, you can fall asleep to anything. You know, like, yes. Yeah. It's like, oh, so soothing. Yeah, just something keeping a nice pulse. Even like a pop song with a beat just, just keeps repeating. That's You can fall asleep to that. Just... Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cool. Well, well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Um, Thank you for having me. I think I'll be in Brisbane sometime in 2018 July. Oh, concert? I'm doing the music of your and I'll be giving concerts the entire month of July. And I imagine Brisbane would be one of the... You're doing the music what? Music of Eva, was it? Yeah. Uh huh. Awesome. Well, okay. Let me know when you're here. Then we can catch up.